Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to continue our uh, lecture series on uh, industrialization, the labor movement, and the progressive movement. Uh, today specifically we're going to be focusing on the labor movement. In previous lectures in this series, uh, you know, we, we've really been kind of focusing on the building of business and the creation of the industrial economy. Uh, which has really done wonders for building American wealth. We are the wealthiest nation on the planet. Uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to be born in the United States and you have a full-time job, you are probably one of the in the top one percent of wage earners in the entire world. Uh, and you know, that really starts to develop during the industrialization movement. Now, uh, because our economy at this point is laissez-faire capitalism, which means unregulated capitalism, uh, there are definitely abuses. And so, you know, it's not all, you know, wealth creation and, you know, movement up the socioeconomic ladder, although there's more of that here than anywhere else in the world. Uh, there's, because there's no regulation, we're also going to see, uh, you know, this, uh, abuse of uh, workers, uh, you know, that people working in unsafe conditions without any kind of, you know, disability or workman's comp uh, to protect them, uh, you know, the no regulations for building safety. We're going to see extremely long hours, uh, you know, a lot of cases, 12 hour days, six days a week uh, for what is barely a livable wage, right? And so this is, you know, these things, uh, you know, the it, you can't go on like this, right? And so even though, you know, capitalism is, is you know, w without a doubt, when you, you compare it to other economic systems around the world, capitalism is most assuredly uh, the, the system that works the best, that lifts the most people out of poverty. Uh, you know, there's just, I mean, there've been studies and studies and studies that have been done and it's just, it's the best system that we have yet to see. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not flawed. Uh, you know, it most certainly is. And just like everything, uh, you know, every real world system is flawed. And so uh, the labor movement is going to start to point that out. Now, essentially, there's always been a labor movement in the United States. Uh, you know, the, the first United States uh, strike was by American tailors uh, that was done in 1768. So, you know, the, 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 the idea that, you know, workers just woke up during the industrial revolution was like we got to get paid better uh, that's kind of a myth they have always been around uh you know the shoemakers in philadelphia uh went on strike this is like the first sustained union strike in 1794 so uh you know we have this long history of organized uh labor now for the most part throughout american history uh, you know, unions, which are just groups of workers that band together to collectively bargain to get the best deals possible, uh, have been primarily skilled labor groups. Uh, we're going to see that uh, during the industrialization movement that that starts to change. Uh, and that makes sense that, you know, pre-industrial revolution, uh, pretty much all labor was skilled labor because it had to be done by hand and you had to have a skill to do that. The thing that industrialization does to make goods cheaper so more people can buy them is it takes the skill out of it. Well, when it takes the skill out of it, uh, you know, workers don't have the same bargaining power that they had when it was skilled labor. If I'm the only one in town that knows how to make shoes, you've got to pay me well or not have shoes. But when you take the skill out of the work and all of a sudden now anybody can make shoes, you know, workers don't have as much bargaining power uh, unless they collectivize within a union. And so that's what this lecture is about is, uh, you know, kind of the collectivization of labor, uh, you know, to uh, increase their bargaining power with their bosses. Oh, uh, some of the early problems, uh, workers have low wages for long hours. And so, you know, you've got uh, people working, like I said before, you know, I mean, it's crazy hours. Sometimes it, it's whatever the boss wants, really. Uh, sometimes it's 10 hours a day, six days a week. Sometimes it's 12, 13 hours a day, six days a week. And essentially, uh, you have to do it. Uh, generally speaking, you weren't paid enough to be able to feed your entire family on just your income, which means that you know, uh, your wife or your kids would probably have to work as well to be able to afford rent and all your food. 
you know, uh, which is, you know, really going to kind of trap people into a cycle of poverty, because if you're spending 12 hours a day, six days a week working, uh, you can't go out and get an education. You can't get like a side job to, to set aside some money to save up to maybe buy your home, right? Which is like your quickest route out of poverty is, you know, learn a skill, own a home. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th this is going to be really kind of uh, disastrous. And if, if you say, no, I'm not going to work those hours, you as a worker essentially have no rights and the, the, your boss can fire you. And there's, you know, there's so much new immigration coming into the United States that there's always another worker that's willing to, uh, you know, to work under those conditions. Right. Uh, women and children are being included in the workplace. Uh, you know, uh, women, a lot, most women are working in the textile industry, but it's not just the textile industry. Uh, generally speaking, because of the cult of domesticity, women don't want to be in the workforce. They want to stay at home and, and you know, uh, you know, raise a family, even though that's not all women, you know, there's always been women that have been, uh, you know, pushing for, uh, you know, the, to be able to, to, you know, own their own business or, or work or go to school or whatever. Uh, most women we know do believe in the cult of domesticity and would prefer to have been at home uh, during this time period. But if you're poor, you had to enter in the workforce. People didn't like that. Men didn't like it. They thought it was a shot at their manhood that they couldn't earn enough to be able to provide for their family. Women thought that, you know, it was um, uh, socially unacceptable. Uh, and then we also had children in the workforce. Now, America has had a long history of children in the workforce. Uh, it's a it's complicated history. Uh, for most of our history, we haven't mind have, children working is normal. It's natural. As a matter of fact, that's why people had kids. When we we're an agrarian society, you know, we think today you know, in modern terms that you know having getting married and having kids is all about love, and you you marry a, your wife or husband because you love them and you want to spend the rest of your life with them, and you have kids because you want to, uh, you know, share that love with your, your, your kids and you want to see a little version of the person you love and raise them and it's going to be so cute. Uh, but that's not what family has been throughout most of history. Most of history, family has been a, an economic contract. It's, you know, division of labor is essentially what it is. And so it's, you know, if you're an agrarian society farming, uh, you did that all day, every day. And it was physical and you had to be strong because we didn't have equipment. And so the men went out and they farmed and it was hard. And, you know, to, to be able to grow enough food for the entire year for your family, you probably needed some help. So uh, you got married and you got married, not because necessarily you love the woman. Hopefully you did, you know, and sometimes people did love each other before they get married. Uh, but you, you got a wife because while you were working on the farm all day, you needed to have your wife at home doing all the things that are necessary to survive, right? Uh, you know, you have to make sure that your, uh, your house is, is cleaned at least to a, a, a level that disease doesn't spread. And your clothes have to be washed without a washing machine, which means somebody's got to like carry it down to the river and like hand scrub it and then dry it with the sun and it's just took all day and cooking food you didn't have a microwave or an oven and you cooked over fire and you know that took all day and so you needed somebody to stay at home and do all that that's why you uh you know you got married is somebody took care of that stuff for you and that just befit women a little bit better uh you know some women were strong enough clearly to to be able to farm but most you know would have struggled more than a man uh but the bigger thing is dad needed help on the farm uh you know if he's got you know a hundred acre farm uh, or even less really uh he needs help with that and so you have children so you have some boys that can come out and help you on that farm well you know mom had to uh you know have those children and then you know mom had to stay at home to take care of those children because mom didn't have gerber baby food right you know the, the dad can't feed the children mom has to and so that's part of the reason why cult of domesticity says women have to stay in the home and then you took to to our point to our lecture today then they took their sons and they worked them on the farm. As soon as they were strong enough to pick up a tool, uh, they were out helping dad on the farm. And so we have this long history of, well, kids are four 
uh, work. That's why you have them. You have sons to work. And then eventually your oldest son takes over the farm and it, your son is your retirement plan. I mean, like, look, it's, it is an economic arrangement. You didn't have your son because you loved him and you wanted to play catch in the backyard. You, you One day you were going to be too old to work and you needed somebody to take care of you. And so you took your farm, you gave it to your eldest son or whatever, and you know he did all the farming and he kept you alive and fed you when you were too old to work. He was literally your 401k before there were 401ks. And so working kids was normal and natural, but then society changed and we became industrial. And when we became industrial, your kid no longer worked for you, right? Now I said that, marriage and kids weren't about love but guess what you know i mean eventually the love, love was there and so you weren't going to work your kid to death or put them in dangerous situation or you know you weren't going to do that because you, you do love your kid um but if your kid is working in a factory if you're in a city and you you, you know you've got to be able to pay the bills and you work in factory a and your kid works in factory b uh does the manager of factory b really care about your kid no. And will he be willing to put him in dangerous situations? The answer is yes. And so all of a sudden we start to see that maybe child labor isn't something uh, that is acceptable. And so it's going to be, you know, workers in these factories that are going to start put, you know, pointing that out. Uh, we're going to start to see that labor is uh, destroying, uh, I'm sorry, the, that industrialization is destroying skilled labor. The whole point of industrialization is to make the work as simple as possible so you can make things as quickly as possible so you can sell them at a lower price so more people can buy it, more people can afford it. And so uh, that is destroying workers' ability to negotiate for good wages. If I'm the only person in town that can do my job, I can negotiate a good wage. But as soon as the industrial process makes what I do so simple that anybody can do it, uh, all of a sudden then I can't demand a high wage because I'm easily replaceable. And so uh, machines are, are allowing that to happen. And so workers have to, if they can't negotiate for a higher wage based just on their skill, then what they have to do is all the workers are going to have to group together and say, hey, we're not going to do that job unless you pay us more to do it. And so, uh, you know, machines are going to essentially force workers to have to collectivize uh, to be able to uh, bargain for good wages. Uh, and then unsafe, unsanitary, poorly lit conditions. I mean, some of these factories are so bad that and and the bosses don't trust their employees that there's no ventilation they lock up all the windows because they they don't want people to be staring out the window they want them working the whole time uh i mean they're gonna regulate i mean the, literally there's going to be situations where people are going to be expected to work a 12-hour day with a 30-minute lunch break and you can't go to the bathroom uh without taking a, a pay cut unless it's on your lunch break and so 12 hours one lunch break like get out of here right and so um they get dirty and filthy and, and there's no building regulations. And so sometimes they like catch on fire and it, it really can be dangerous. There's machines and there's no like regulations for the safety of the machines. And so if you're working on a machine and you get a finger cut off, well, too bad, you know, keep working or lose your job. And so, uh, you know, this is really not a great situation. Um, we got some pictures here of, of workers during industrialization. These are women, uh, you know, young girls that are, are working in, uh, you know, textile mills. Again, if a dad can't get his daughter married off, uh, you know, uh, one of the ways to kind of recoup the loss of having a daughter uh, economically is to, uh, you know, send them out to the uh, textile mills uh, so they can earn a living. If they're not going to be helping on the farm, uh, they can, you know, get a job and help, you know, pay bills uh, that way. And so, you know, the, I mean, just like, that's a terrible situation to be in. We're going to see young children in factories. Factories are going to like young kids, particularly if there's lots of machines, uh, because they have small hands and their hands can fit, uh, you know, in places adult hands can't between all the moving parts, which ends up being uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, you see pictures of kids like this, and I think these kids are adorable, and everybody goes, oh, look how cute they are. Uh, but think about what this means for this kid. If this kid's working in a factory, uh, you know, uh, what's he not doing? 
not going to school. And so it's, it's this kind of work that, yeah, he's putting food, he's taking care of an immediate need, right? Mom and dad don't make enough money to pay rent and have food on the table. And so you got to put the kid to work. The kid might be making the difference for the family's survival. And so he's doing something very important, but this is what's going to trap uh, families into cycles of poverty is because this kid isn't in school. The kid's not learning a skill. And we talk about that. If, if you want to be able to make money, and this is true today, if you want to be able to make money and make it into the middle class and be financially secure, you have to have a skill. You have to learn something that people are willing to pay you a decent amount of money for. Uh, and so, you know, this kid, because he's working in a factory, he's not going to school, he's not learning a skill. Uh, and because the hours are so long, he's not going to be able to do it on the side either. And so, you know, this kid is going to be raised poor and he's probably going to grow up to be poor. And that's, you know, one of the primary reasons why we, 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 we're going to have to get kids out of the workforce. Now, that's not why we do it. We do it during World War II. We get kids out of the workforce, not because we like are trying to protect kids. It's because, you know, every kid that's not working, their dad can take that job. And so it's more about protecting jobs for, you know, adults uh, than it is protecting kids. But one of the ancillary effects, one of the, the kind of side effects uh, is that then kids can go to school, they can learn a skill. And then that's why there's so much social mobility in, in America and in the Western countries, uh, because we've taken kids out of the workforce and allowed them to uh, spend their youth learning skills uh, that are going to make them more socially mobile. Right. Uh, these kids, these kids are the worst. I mean, not the kids aren't the worst. They're in the worst conditions. That was terrible. I didn't, I didn't mean to say they're the worst. Uh, these kids are working in uh, coal mines. And so this is one of the better jobs to have at the time. Uh, it does pay a livable wage because it is such hard work. Uh, if you ever want to understand how difficult it is to work in uh, coal mines, I, I would recommend, uh, there's a book by George Orwell called The Road to Wigan Pier. Uh, I recommend you read that. It's not an American coal mine, but it is uh, definitely descriptive of what it's like to work in a coal mine. Uh, Road to Wigan Pier is about coal mines in England. Uh, you know, it's it's terrible. It's long work. They have to work generally, you know, 10 hours a day, uh, not the 12 hours because it is brack breaking labor. But, uh, you know, a lot of times they have to like go underground and then crawl underground for miles before they get to the workplace. They don't get paid for that trip. It's back breaking labor uh, to be able to do that. And uh, kids were desired for those jobs because you know you're in a cave underground and kids can fit in places adults can't uh hopefully you've noticed i mean it is dirty it's grimy it's awful uh, they do have to pay people a little bit more because uh you know just it's it's tough to find people that are willing to do it if you don't uh because if you look at these kids you'll notice the black coal dust around their mouth uh you know these kids uh, the, working in the coal mine this young it's a death sentence they're going to get that coal dust in their lungs and it's going to kill them you know uh, before they get to be young men um, or before they get to be actual men while they're young men. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that the, these kids, they're, you know, they're doing what they have to do to, to, to meet the needs of their family. And when you present somebody with, you know, two options or with an option that's got two results, one is that, you know, the job will kill you uh, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years, but it will pay enough to meet your immediate needs. People are desperate enough. They'll take that job. And, and that's what happens with these kids. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a bad situation. It's definitely a bad situation. So uh, workers start to realize very quickly that the, the only real weapon that they have against their bosses is a strike. And so uh, if they group together, if I go to my employer, just me, and I say, give me a raise, I think I deserve it. Whether I deserve it or not, my boss is probably going to say, no, you're fired. And then because that sets an example, anybody else that comes to ask for a raise, uh, they might get fired and then people won't do it and they get to save money and, and make, uh, you know, a larger profit. Now, it's because I, as an individual worker, don't have much power. But if I am, you know, in a factory and I'm not getting paid well, and during my lunch break, I'm talking to other workers, I'm like, man, we don't get paid well. We should probably do something about that. And everybody's like, yeah, let's go demand a raise together. Uh, and I'm like, Ooh, you know, but remember that other guy that got fired when he asked for a raise? 
And, you know, all, then I'll say, well, how can we overcome that? The group comes together. And they say, you know what? We'll say we're all in it together, that we all want a raise. And if we don't all get a raise, we'll all stop working. Uh, and all of a sudden now, ooh, we have some leverage on our boss. And so that's just essentially what a strike is. It's just the workers saying, look, uh, we want a raise. And even though I'm replaceable, it's going to be very difficult to replace everybody. It will take you a long time to hire those people. And every day that your factory's not working, you're going to lose money. Then you're going to have to train those people. You know, even though the job that we're doing is, you know, I am replaceable. I've been doing it a long time. So I'm going to be faster than those new people. Uh, I could do it better. And so uh, I have a little bit of power over my, my employer. And so, uh, you know, that's how unions start to form. It's this group that will collectively bar bargain. Uh, and essentially the, their bargaining chip or the leverage that they have is the strike. And so we're going to start to see uh, these strikes. Now, these strikes ultimately, you know, are going to, not all of them, but, uh, you know, quite a few of them are going to turn violent. And the violence goes both ways. Sometimes it's the the strikers that that they'll surround i don't just take the day off when i go on strike i actually surround the building uh because my boss is going to hire other workers those workers uh, are derogatorily called scabs they're people that are willing to cross the picket line that's the line of strikers they're saying give us a raise uh and so sometimes the workers, when they see those scabs, are going to beat up the, the scabs to intimidate them to keep them away from their factory. My strike fails if my boss hires a bunch of new people, so I can't have that. So sometimes that's the violence. Sometimes it's the uh, owners that are going to uh, instigate the violence. And essentially the owners are going to look at those strikers and they're going to say, I can't have this. I don't want to be bullied because if I'm bullied, then my workers are just going to demand outrageous sums of money that'll run my business in the ground. So what they do is sometimes they like, you know, they, they hire criminals to go in and fight the workers. And if the, if it's, uh, female strikers, they sometimes hire local prostitutes to go in and beat up uh, the female workers. Uh, sometimes they call in the state militia. And so like the government generally sides with the owners. What they say is the business is the property of the owner. And if you don't want to work for them, you don't have to, but you're not allowed to, uh, uh, you know, strike uh, and keep that owner from using his business the way he wants to use it is the way the government looks at it. And so sometimes the state militias will get call, called in and it's the government uh, that is uh, being violent here. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, who's the, the direct result of the violence? I think you can share that blame around. I think that's the, the only uh, accurate way of, of looking at it. Each different, each case is different. Uh, generally speaking, um, you know, the, uh, the most violent side of these are going to be the owners and the government. Um, and, you know, that kind of changes with time. It's, that doesn't always, that generalized statement doesn't always hold true. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, it does. Uh, in Baltimore, uh, Thomas Scott's Railroad, we had talked about Thomas Scott when we talked about Andrew Carnegie. That's where Carnegie got his career. Uh, the workers there are going to be tearing up tracks and lighting buildings on fire. The state militia gets called in and Thomas Scott actually says, uh, his quote is something along the lines of, let them try a rifle diet for a few days. Uh, like that, uh, which it means essentially have the militia shoot them up. And so uh, that turns super violent and the, the strike uh, eventually gets put down, but it'll ruin Scott because they just like burn everything. Uh, and so, you know, there's multiple examples of that uh, over time, uh, you know, the Homestead strike uh, and, and multiple others. So, uh, you know, the labor movement during this time period is going to go grow pretty quickly because uh, businesses aren't being regulated at all. Uh, you know, there's not many of them that aren't paying extremely low wages. And so, uh, you know, what happens is we industrialize and you put more and more workers in these factories, they're gonna inevitably start talking about, you know, how little they're getting paid and, and you know, the, 
so these gigantic factories that have hundreds or thousands of workers in it, you know, uh, the, by the fact that you're putting them all in one factory, the owners are organizing the workers themselves. Of course, they're going to talk. And when they talk, they start to realize that their strength in numbers and labor grows. Uh, in 1877, we only have three national unions, uh, you know, by 1880, there's 18. And so they're just popping up everywhere. And uh, the labor movement is getting stronger. There's more and more strikes, uh, which means some workers are getting paid better. You know, the, the, some of these strikes will be effective, uh, but there's no national change, right? Uh, each time we have one of these strikes and, and you know, uh, uh, business is forced to, you know, lower the hours and increase the pay. That's only for that business. We're not seeing, you know, great big national change. And we won't really see a lot of national change uh, until World War II, Great Depression era. So one of the first of the, the great big uh, labor unions is gonna be the Knights of Labor that's organized by a guy by the name of uh, Uriah Stevens. Uh, Uriah Stevens is, uh, this believer in, you know, uh, that, that the larger the numbers, the better. And so if, if you're going to be able to get real change, we need to organize all workers. Uh, and that seems right, but it's actually not. Uh, if you're going to strike and, and if, if your tool to get your boss to give you what you want and what you need is the strike, uh, you have to, numbers are important, but it's not as important as unity. Re honestly, if you're going to strike the first time, you know, a couple of workers say, you know what, I'm going back to work. I got to feed my family. Uh, the first few that go all of a sudden can potentially lead to a flood of people going back to work. Because think about if you're striking, that's no easy thing. You're not getting a paycheck while you're striking. And so, you know, generally the owners of the business have more money set aside to survive a strike than the workers do. And so striking requires you know, sacrifice on the workers end. And so it's really hard to get people to do that. And so if you have just gigantic numbers and the, the Knights of Labor are going to become this gigantic group because they let in skilled and unskilled workers, they don't always agree to strike together. And so their unity is going to be relatively weak. So it emits all workers. Uh, whether you're skilled or unskilled. And this is the problem because you're not going to have unity between skilled and unskilled workers, right? I'm a skilled worker. I went to college. I got a degree. I passed all kinds of state tests and licensure. It is very hard to replace me uh, because you got to find somebody else who has literally spent years and years and years uh, practicing their craft uh, to be able to replace me. And so that's hard to do. Now your local unskilled labor, right? Uh, let's just say the uh, uh, cart pusher at the grocery store. Uh, really, uh, anybody can do that job. You can be trained to do that job in a day or two. Uh, and, you know, I want, as a worker, I want that cart pusher to make as much money as possible. Uh, right. And I want him to be able to do all the things that he can do so he can get as much money as possible. But am I a skilled worker, right, who's made massive sacrifices, including uh, incurring all kinds of student loan debt, right? So I've, I've not only have I sacrificed time, but I've, I've sacrificed my own money to get in the position that I'm in. Am I willing to go on strike for a, a cart pusher who wants to make, a, you know, an extra couple dollars an hour that isn't in the kind of debt that I'm in? and uh, you know, hasn't spent the years trying to train themselves to be able to do a skilled job. And the reality is I, I, I'm probably not. I want that person to make as much money as possible, uh, but I'm not gonna be unified uh, behind uh, that guy and, and make the financial sacrifice of not working so that you know, unskilled worker can get a raise. And that's not because I don't like that unskilled worker. It's just because, I, you know, I, I have bills to pay. And if I'm going to make sacrifices, uh, you know, it's it, it's got to benefit me at least in some tangential kind of way. Now, if I see that the you know, uh, local cart pushers are being mistreated and, and they do need an extra dollar or two, I might stop shopping at that grocery store to support that, that you know, uh, local union, uh, unskilled union. 
you know, I might do other things. I might donate some money to their strike fund or, or something like that. I might help them, but am I going to stop working to help that person? Probably not. And that's what's going to happen with uh, the uh, Knights of Labor and why ultimately they'll fail is they're not going to be able to unify uh, everybody uh, behind their cause. And, and it's mostly because the skilled and unskilled laborers aren't going to agree on uh, on when to strike. Uh, now, the other thing the Knights of Labor are going to do is that they're very early on in uh, this process are going to allow in uh, any ethnicity. And so uh, you're going to see essentially uh, white and black. Now, uh, I say any ethnicity, they will exclude the Chinese. Uh, you know, so it's it's not really any ethnicity, but it is going to be a, uh, you know, multi-racial uh, group. Uh, they're going to advocate for an eight-hour workday. Uh, they're going to want to get rid of child labor, again, mostly because it will create more jobs for adults. Uh, but, you know, there is an argument also. Some people are arguing that we need to protect the kids. Uh, and then they want uh, political reforms and regulation on businesses. And so, uh, you know, business owners who have a lot of money really kind of uh, are able to influence the political machines at the time. And so uh, they want to, you know, uh, you know, labor movements don't just want uh, shorter work hour, working hours and more money. They also want to limit the influence of political machines. And so they also want things like direct election of senators and, and things that give average individuals more say in government. Uh, to, in, to, to, to lessen the influence of money in politics. Now, uh, the Knights of Labor reaches its peak relatively early. Uh, it'll disappear by 1895, essentially because a couple of things. They don't have enough money uh, to successfully strike. Uh, and that, that, you know, that's always really kind of been a problem for unions with unskilled labor is, you know, the that you got to have a lot of money set aside to be able to strike. And, and I have, you know, I personally have an emergency fund. So if, you know, uh, I ever have to go on strike, I'm going to have three to six months of money set aside to pay bills while I'm not getting a paycheck. Uh, and so you got to really prepare to be able to strike. And, you know, unions have to set aside money too uh, to be able to help get their union members through these kind of strikes. So if you don't have cash, generally speaking, your employer can withstand the strike longer than the worker. And so money is 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 important here. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is unskilled labor is just too easily replaceable during strikes. If I decide to walk out of work with all my other uh, teachers, what ends up happening is you cannot, a school can't replace all of their teachers. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it would take, you know, months and months to be able to do that. And so it's, it's very difficult to replace me, um, which gives me a little bit of power with my employer. Uh, but if you're, we'll go back to the cart pusher, uh, the cart pusher, that's noble work, man. Every job is, is important in society and every job deserves to get paid the maximum amount that society's willing to pay them. And so I'm, you know, I support uh, you know, the, that, you know, cart pushers making as much money as possible, but because it doesn't take years and years to train, to be able to do that job, if they go on strike, uh, you know, the, the next day, the employer can start hiring people to, uh, you know, replace those cart pushers. And so, uh, it's just too easy to break that kind of uh, strike. Uh, and then because Unions have skilled and unskilled, uh, just the, the skilled workers, you're going to find that they just aren't going to be very supportive of the unskilled workers' strikes. And in a large part, it's like, well, you didn't make the sacrifices I made to get here. And so we just don't, you know, it's, I'm sorry, because I, I, I've made all these sacrifices in time uh, and, and whatnot, I, I just, I don't want to sacrifice what I've achieved uh, for somebody who hasn't made those same sacrifices that I, I've made. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that personally, I'm just saying that's what happens with uh, the. So, um, now these strikes, when we talk about these strikes getting violent, uh, one of the things that, you know, we're seeing that union membership kind of go through the roof as workers get frustrated. Uh, but, uh, because of some of the violence and the way that the violence within some of these strikes gets portrayed, we're going to see union membership will drop 
after the Haymarket riot uh, because of how the Haymarket riot plays out. And so uh, there's these uh, large labor protests at the McCormick Reaper Works. And uh, while they're there, uh, the the police break up the, the riot and uh, one of, or break up the protest. And one of the protesters is killed. And so then the next day there's this huge protest uh, in Haymarket Square. And it's because it, now it's not just about uh, the, you know, the strike. It's it's also about and then labor. Uh, it's also about, you know, the, the police that attacked some of the, uh, the some of the the workers. And so there's this huge event where all kinds of people are, are showing up uh, and protesting. Uh, because of what happened at the McCormick Reaper Works. And while that's going on, uh, what we see is an unidentified protester throws a bomb at the police uh, and the bomb goes off. Uh, here's the problem. Within this group of protesters, 90% of them, 95%, of them, 99% of them, I, I don't, nobody really knows the numbers, are just workers that want to make more money, right? And that, that's great. That's democracy. That's the American system. We're supposed to do that. Now, mixed in that group are some radicals, uh, communists that want to upend capitalism. Most of these workers agree with capitalism. It's, you know, the, they, they, they're, a lot of them are, come from immigrant families that have moved to America uh, because there's just way more social mobility here. And so they like capitalism. They just want to regulate it a little bit more. But communists want to upend the system. They want to get rid of pri private property. They want, you know, they want all that gone. Some of them are socialists, and they want the government to completely control the economy and uh, set wages and hours and determine who works which job. Uh, some of them are anarchists that essentially want no government at all and just, uh, you know, want the complete freedom. And you know, the average person doesn't. That, you know, less than 1% of the population in America is communist at the time. So, you know, two, 3% of, of people agree with these radicals. But the radicals are, I mean, they're real believers and they're, they're willing to uh, be violent to get their agenda across. And so uh, what we believe is an anarchist throws the bomb at, at the crowd. When that happens, the police open fire. Seven policemen and one civilian die. What happens next is that the the media and you know the the public blame the protesters essentially as like all being anarchists and communists that are trying to upend the complete system and because there's violence and we see this over and over in history generally speaking when the protests remain peaceful over time we will get long lasting and real change but when the protests turn violent right? Uh, there's generally a reaction against that violence, even though 95, 96, 97% of the protesters are nonviolent. And so ultimately what happens here is this creates real serious anti-labor feelings. The idea is these radicals, a lot of them are, are immigrants from Europe. Uh, and so the, the it creates this like anti-immigrant feeling or xenophobia, this fear of foreigners. Uh, and so uh, people start to turn against labor as being infiltrated by foreigners that are trying to dismantle our system. And, and the average person doesn't want our system dismantled because, again, there's more social mobility in the United States than anywhere else in the world. And, and you know, we, we want to maintain the system that's working better than all the other systems. And so, uh, you know, that's you know, these people start to, the average person starts to associate the labor movement unfairly with communist, socialists, and anarchists. Eight anarchists get round up. We call them anarchists with quotes because they're really just labor leaders. They're like, uh, you know, newspaper editors that support the labor movement. They're union leaders and they will be tried and convicted in what is essentially a biased trial. Seven of those eight members will get the death penalty. Now, tragically, four of them will be actually executed. They're going to be hung. One will commit suicide while he's uh, in prison. And then uh, there's going to be three others that we're going to recognize like, oops, you know, with hindsight, after all this is said and done and, and all the feelings have, hostile feelings have calmed down, we're going to realize that these, we, we, these are the wrong guys. Uh, 
uh, that just because they were labor supporters doesn't mean that they were advocating for violence. And so uh, three people will have their uh, sentences commuted, which is just a shame that, you know, five people had to die uh, before that happened. So uh, the Knights of Labor is essentially over, but we learn from our mistakes. And this guy right here, Samuel Gompers, is going to realize we still need unions, right? We haven't fixed this problem of low wages and long hours. And so, uh, you know, the, if the Knights of Labor aren't going to be affected because there wasn't enough unity with skilled and unskilled labor, uh, what Samuel Gompers is going to do is he's going to start to organize uh, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which is still around today. Um, and he's going to organize it uh, very successfully because he's going to only include skilled workers, people that are willing to uh, you know, make sacrifices together because they've all uh, you know, undergone the same experience. It's a more unified group. All right. Uh, and so uh, what he's going to do instead of, instead of saying one large union, it's like, OK, let's have, you know, the cord wainers over here. Let's have the blacksmiths over here. And so then that way, you know, if blacksmiths are being mistreated, the blacksmiths all strike together and maybe the cord wainers don't. And, you know, sometimes they'll strike together or whatever. Uh, but if you group people uh, based on their commonality in these kind of situations, when you're talking about economic commonality, uh, you know, they're more likely to be unified and to be able to survive a strike. Um, so uh, we're going to see with the uh, AFL uh, that because uh, they're going to be a little bit less radical, they're going to be more unified. Uh, they're not going to be promoting, you know, socialist uh, and communistic ideas. They want to be less radical because they want the average person to kind of uh, to to to. to to relate to them, I guess, is the, what I'm looking for. Uh, they're they're going to be more successful. Uh, they are going to see across industries higher wages and shorter hours. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the idea of, you know, a five-day work week, an eight-hour work day, uh, you know, the, the AFL is going to be, uh, you know, very much uh, responsible, not solely responsible, very much responsible for uh, you know, getting us the kind of uh, general work week that we view today as as normal. Uh, they're going to get better working conditions. Uh, you know, make these uh, business owners clean up their factories, make things a little bit more safe. Uh, benefits for disabled workers. I mean, think about that today. I mean, if you get hurt at work, who do you expect to take care of uh, the hospital bill? Well, yeah, your employer, right? You wouldn't have been hurt if it wasn't for uh, you know. Uh, the conditions at work. And so uh, AFL is going to really be instrumental in that. There are some negatives because again, they're going to take that commonality thing a little too far. I mean, it's good that you're going to have like all blacksmiths being in one union. Uh, you know, that's good, but they're, they're also going to exclude women, African-Americans and immigrants, uh, you know, as well as unskilled workers. And, and the idea is that, you know, uh, your, your average worker isn't going to strike for somebody of a different ethnic group. And so, you know, they're, they're going to say, well, you know, African-Americans should have their own unions and they will. Uh, but, you know, they're just not going to be because it's such a small, African-Americans are such a small percentage of the workforce. Uh, you know, it, it's not going to be as powerful as the AFL. And so it's going to kind of set back, you know, female and African-American, uh, unions that they're just not going to be as strong until they get included in AFL. Today, they clearly are, right? But, uh, you know, initially they won't be. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, the, these violent, these uh, strikes uh, oftentimes uh, turn violent. And again, sometimes it's the, the workers, sometimes it's the bosses or the government. More often than not, uh, the initial kind of violence comes from the, the bosses and the, the government, uh, at least until, you know, you start to get into the 1920s and 1930s. And then uh, all right, uh, that concludes our lecture for the day. Thank you very much. I will see you again shortly. Have a wonderful day.